Welcome back everybody. In today's video, we're gonna talk about the most common issues with the Gen 3 Montero. So if you're new to this platform, this is anything from 2001 to 2006. And I have owned a lot of these. I've owned probably about 10 of them with lots of different issues. I've rebuilt the motor. I've touched almost every nut and bolt on this platform. And so I wanna talk about the most common things that break, go wrong, or cause issues with this platform. Some of these are pretty minor and some of them are pretty major, leading to catastrophic engine failure or even you crashing your car. So with that, let's jump under the hood. So underneath the hood, let's talk about the actual engine and problems with this motor. Now, this is the 3.8 liter V6. This came in 2003, four, five, and six, but the same issues are shared between all models of the Gen 3. So that's 02 and 01 as well. So the first one I wanna talk about is gonna be this valve cover right here. Both valve covers tend to have some issues, but this valve cover tends to be a bigger issue. And almost every Montero that I've seen has an oil leak from right back here. Now, this is a freshly rebuilt motor. I changed this one out myself, and so this one's not leaking yet. But somehow, the way they designed this, whether it's the heat from the motor or the way they, they designed this gasket or valve cover, almost all of them will leak right there. It'll drip down onto the exhaust, and you might smell it. So that's a really common issue over there, is it a, a leaky valve cover. Also on this side of the motor is another issue, and that's cracked exhaust manifolds. Here's an example of what a cracked manifold looks like. And this one, in, in this case, it's cracked on the bottom. This one is also cracked on the bottom. And this is a pretty common thing with a lot of cars, so it's not specifically unique. However, I have yet to pull a set of manifolds off of a Gen 3 Montero and not have a crack. So it seems to be an issue with these. I don't know if it was the casting. I don't know if it's the location. Usually what happens is these get hot because you're running your car. Then you splash some water on them and the heating and cooling makes these crack because they're cast iron. You can't really weld them. It looks like maybe someone tried to repair this one. You just have to replace them. So that's another common issue for these. Moving up to the top of the motor, on these 3.8s, there's a vacuum actuated butterfly valve assembly in here. And there are two issues that are caused by this. One of them is more common and more talked about, and that's that these butterfly valves actually get loose and they drop down inside of the motor. They can even sometimes slip into the valves, get into the valve train a little bit. You can drop a screw into the combustion cycle. It can make all sorts of noise, can cause piston wall damage, piston damage, valve damage it can cause a lot of issues. Some people come in and they actually remove those butterfly valves, but more commonly people tighten up those screws and make sure they're still good. With that, there's another issue with these and that's this O-ring right in here. It is very hard to see. It's right behind that little bolt right there. And what's happening down there is there's an O-ring at the end of the rod that goes through and holds the butterfly valves and that O-ring starts to deteriorate. It starts to leak and you get a vacuum leak causing a lean code right here from the front. So that's the big two issues with the top of the motor. Moving over to this side, we have another very commonly talked about issue and that is the brake booster and brake booster accumulator and brake booster motor. So if you're familiar with the way that a brake booster works, this builds pressure to pressurize your brake system so that a little bit of input on the pedal equals a lot of input or output at the wheels. So there's two main issues with this. One of them is this brake booster accumulator right here. On the O2 and O1 models, it's a black kind of sphere and this one's more of a gold cylinder, but this is what holds the pressure. And these tend to leak with time. It'll kind of create a chirping sound um, when you hit the brakes. And so that's what's leaking right there if you hear that. And that failure, that leak can cause you to have motor failure. Now, the motor is down here. I'll show you another clip where I take this whole thing apart. But the motor is down here and that motor is what spins and builds pressure that is stored in this accumulator. And when this accumulator goes bad, it puts extra stress on the motor because it can't hold the pressure. And so because it can't hold that, this motor works more than it needs to, it works harder than it needs to, it gets worn out. So you lose all power braking if this system goes bad. It's very expensive to replace. You'll get all sorts of warning lights and sounds and whatever inside of the dash. But this is a big issue with these. And this actually early on led to some recalls because so many Monteros were losing braking or power braking and were rear ending things. And so this is a big issue, one that you definitely need to pay attention to if either of these components is going bad. 
on the less deadly side of things, I have seen so many of these with cracked battery trays. In fact, you can see mine is cracked right here. These is made of some kind of weird plastic composite. They're very strange and they get very brittle with age. And so what happens is people are tightening these down, trying to cinch down a new battery and they break off these tabs, making it so they can't even strap their battery down. I've obviously replaced this one. I've replaced it twice now and mine is still showing a little bit of damage, but it's really common that those break. So that's the battery tray. But then over here, the air box is actually made of the same kind of weird plastic composite material. And what breaks on these is these little tabs right here where the top of the air box and the MAF sensor slots in. So this is the bottom and these tabs break off. There's some in the back and there's some on this side. It's very common that these are shattered and broken off and that people have to figure out another way to get this to sit secure so that junk doesn't get in their intake system. Now moving down into this corner, you can see another issue and we'll talk more about this when we get inside, but this is your four wheel drive actuator. So this whole four wheel drive system is controlled mostly by vacuum. And this does a lot of work to tell which wheels to engage and how to engage the transfer case and front diff and all of that. This is controlled electronically. So there's little switches in here and that you control from inside. And these go bad all the time. And that can result in the flashing four wheel drive lights. And it can cause you all sorts of issues in shifting with your transfer case. So that's located right here. And almost all of them that I've run into have failed at one point or another. And the best way to replace them is with an OEM replacement. Back down on this side of the motor, you can see if you get way down in here, another common issue. And that right there is it. That's your O2 sensor. It's coming right off the back of the manifold right here. And you have several of them throughout this car. So you have four O2 sensors total on this vehicle. And the ones that cause the biggest issues are gonna be these guys right here, which are monitoring the catalytic converters. And so it's very, very common, one, to have catalytic converter failure, but two, for these just to go bad. These go bad, they get worn out, whatever. And so they'll throw a catalytic converter code. This is extremely common. You've got to replace them with a high quality sensor to make sure that they work. Or worst case scenario, you have to get a whole new catalytic converter for this, which can be very expensive. So that's another issue is these O2 sensors. So the last two big issues underneath the hood before we get around to the rest of the vehicle are the biggest ones. If you've watched any of my other videos, you've seen me talk about valve stem seals in these motors. It is the Achilles heel of the Montero in general. It's especially bad on these ones. So these valve stem seals go bad, they wear out, and they're way deep into the motor. It's a lot of work to get to them. They're a very cheap seal to replace, but it takes hours and hours and hours of labor to get in there. It's a big job to get in. And if you don't replace them, this thing is gonna burn oil like crazy. I've had it so bad that I'm burning a quart of oil every time I fill up my gas tank because of just burning oil inside of those valve stem seals. So it's an issue with the way they designed the seal or the heat that's going through it. Something is not right. And so these all suffer from having leaky valve stem seals. You'll know that you'll have a leaky valve stem seal if you're losing oil, but you're not dripping it on the ground and you're seeing blue smoke come out of the tailpipe. And last but not least is the timing belt tensioner. Let's go to the bench and I'll show you what that is and why it fails. So this is what the hydraulic tensioner looks like outside of the vehicle. You can see right now it's got a pin in it. This one's a brand new OEM part. Just picked it up as a replacement for one of my own cars. But I wanted to show you this right here. This seal right there is what holds the hydraulic pressure in this unit. And that seal over time can start to leak. And when that leaks, it allows this pin, which is responsible for all of the tensioning, to go back and forth more than it should, and it can create a crazy rattling sound. So when that goes bad, what ends up happening is the tension on this belt comes loose, it skips a couple teeth, and you can have catastrophic engine failure. Hopefully you catch it before that. These make a terrible sound when they go out. It sounds like rod knock and it causes all sorts of issues with skipping, but if you catch it soon enough, you can remedy it. So there's the issue with the hydraulic tensioner. So that's it for under the hood. Now let's talk about other common issues around the vehicle. Here's another common issue for you, is you'll get a vibration at about 2,100 RPMs and it's because of these transmission bushings. So these guys right here, 
wear out over time and it causes all of this stuff to vibrate just a little bit around 2000 to 2200 rpm really prominent in the 2100 rpm range so if you get that if you get a little bit of vibration as you're coming through the rpms you just got to replace these it's honestly not too hard but it can be really annoying if you don't know what it is and it's very common on these coming around to the rear another extremely common issue with these is seized alignment bolts and you can see mine right here for the lower control arms as well as right up here for the toe in the rear. Now these get seized very commonly because a lot of stuff builds up in the back of these vehicles and it just doesn't get serviced that much. What happens is then as suspension components wear out, your alignment gets off, you start frying tires, and these are a nightmare. I've got another video on how to replace those and why I run Polytuff bushings back here, but this is a very, very common issue. And it's not as simple as just going and getting alignment. You have to cut these bolts out. You've got to replace them with new hardware. It's very labor intensive. It can be expensive and a huge headache, but that's a super common issue on these Gen 3 Monteros. And while it's more common on the rear, there are two alignment bolts on the front. You've got this one here in the front of the lower control arm and in the back, and those tend to seize as well and can cause you issues. The last common issue on the bottom side of the car is this transfer case and the switches that go on top of it, but it's hard to show you inside the vehicle. So let's go to one I pulled outside the vehicle to show you what's wrong with them and how they work. So here I have a transmission and a transfer case taken out of a Gen 3 outside of the vehicle. And here you can see these five switches on the top. So what's happening is inside of here, there's all sorts of motors and things moving around to select different gears, different drive modes to link up the four wheel drive system. And all of these sensors detect where everything is at inside of this box. So if any one of these goes bad, if it gets stuck, if it's having trouble reading, if any of these wires get damaged, this is gonna trigger your four wheel drive lights to flash. Different ones mean different things, but most of the time it's gonna be that center diff light is gonna be flashing. And this is one of the main causes for it. So obviously if it's out like this, it's really easy to replace, but dropping that thing down inside of the car, that can be a pain. So anyways, there's your four wheel drive switches. Here's what they look like on this side. Another very annoying and common issue with the rear is that this handle breaks off and therefore you can't open the back. So what actually happens is up here, you can see this is made of that same brittle material we saw in the engine bay for the battery box and air box. And the end of this snaps off. So the handle stays there, but the actuating lever up there actually breaks off. And so you can squeeze this all you want, but it's not gonna open. The really annoying thing about that is you can't get to your rear door. And in order to get to it, you have to take all of this off. So you have to crawl inside the vehicle, get back here, tear all this off, manually actuate it and then disassemble it from the inside. This is a really common issue. Almost everyone I know who's owned a Gen 3 goes to open this one day and it's just not happening. And then they get to experience the joys of replacing that latch. Now, before we head inside the vehicle, there's one more issue that almost every Gen 3 I've ever experienced has, and it's got to do with this key fob. For some reason, they did not figure out key fob technology in 2003 because none of these key fobs seem to work. No matter how much I push it, unless I get right up next to it, it doesn't seem to do anything. As soon as I touch the vehicle with it, it wants to unlock or lock. But if I'm any distance away, it does not communicate with the vehicle at all. It's so frustrating. I've even tried to change these out. I've reprogrammed them. I've got new batteries. These things are almost worthless. It seems like they don't work at all. But with that, let's head inside the vehicle and look at the most common problems on the interior. Now, the first problem with these that happens on every single Montero that I have ever seen happens when you first open up the door and you look at the seat. Right here, you can see that I have a massive tear in the seat cushion on the driver's side. Now I've tried to repair this, it's not very good, but what happens is there's a sharp metal bit in the seat frame right behind that. And as you're sliding your butt in and out of this seat, it just digs in here and rips it. Even the nicest Monteros, the most well-kept pristine Monteros that I've seen have a tear in that spot of the driver's seat. It seems to be really common, kind of poor design. There should have been more padding there. And also we just need to pick our butts up when we sit in the car. So that's the first issue on the interior. Now that we're inside the car, here's another super common issue is these glove boxes. For some reason, the way they designed them, these get stuck and become non-operational. And so you squeeze this and it doesn't drop this pin down and these get stuck shut. I've had to drill these out before and uh, it's happened on my personal rigs. It's happened on other friends rigs. You go to open this and it doesn't open. You have to drill through this entire thing to get this to pop out because the screws to drop this out are actually on the inside. 
So it happens on both of these. Obviously, this one's gonna be a little bit different because it has a keyhole in it, but either way, you've gotta drill through these to get them out, and then you can replace them. Another similar issue happens when you get to the armrest. This armrest has a few compartments. It'll open in two different spots, as well as mine will slide front and back. And the most common issue is with this latch right here. This one breaks all the time. It's kind of flimsy and fragile, and it's got a spring on it, and people are just grabbing on it too much, or maybe your kids grab it and rip it apart. And then what happens is this will just flop up and down and won't be able to latch, or this spring is almost the exact same design, and this one breaks very often as well. Thankfully, they're pretty easy to get, pretty easy to replace, but it can be super annoying, and it's very common. Another very common issue that's a very minor inconvenience is these sun visors tend to snap right here. You can see there's supposed to be a tab here that kind of holds this in. And as you can see on this one, this one hasn't snapped quite yet, but it's broken. So it's not putting any tension there. These just get worn out with time and they do snap off. And it's not that big a deal, but it is kind of annoying that it no, no longer holds it in place the way it should. So thankfully again, those are easy to replace, but almost every single one I've ever seen is broken. Another really common issue with these is that the sunroof is non-operational because the motor has loose bolts. This motor actually has these screws that hold it and they get loose. Now I haven't touched this with a tool and you can already see, look at this one. That screw is hand tight at best. So what happens is these screws drop out, this motor becomes disconnected from here and it stops the operation of your sunroof. And so what you have to do, you gotta get in here and you gotta tighten up these bolts, make sure this is good. It's also common that you have to come in here and lube up the rails, but that's a good one to keep in mind because this happens all the time. Uh, these bolts just work their way out, whether you use your sunroof or not. And so if your sunroof is having issues, it might not be the motor, it might just be these screws. So there's another issue to check out on the Gen 3. So the last of the interior issues become obvious when you turn the car on and you're inside. So there's a few issues and I've actually fixed all of them. So I'm gonna show you what they are, even though I can't demonstrate them to you on my car. So the first issue I see all the time is that this temp gauge or sometimes the gas gauge, their resistor is broken. And I made a whole video about this, but what happens is when this goes bad, it skyrockets to high. And so you'll see guys who are taking pictures of their dash or asking questions, and this thing is just pegged all the way to the top, but their car is actually fine. It's not overheating. The resistor is just bad, and so it reads high. Same with the gas gauge. It might read way lower than it actually is because that resistor is causing issues. So these gauges tend to be an issue. Another common issue is demonstrated right here with the flashing front four-wheel drive lights. What happens here is you're shifting in between two different mo modes in the transfer case and something gets confused, a sensor doesn't work, a vacuum line is, is freaking out, something is not right and the car does not understand what's happening with its front wheels and it'll flash those lights at you. If it flashes for long enough, it'll actually lock you out of the transfer case and you'll get a flashing light in the middle you get a flashing light kind of like that in the middle, but it'll just stay on. It'll actually lock you out of the transfer case. Another common issue with these is that these dash lights are just burnt out. So maybe one of your wheel indicators is burnt out from being on all the time. It also happens over here with the park, reverse, neutral, and drive. It just depends on which one of these is activated, but it's often one of these rear ones is just burnt out from time. And so it looks like you're only in one wheel drive, which is not true. It's just that one of these lights is burned out. Again, I made a video of how to replace all these bulbs. Check it out if you have this issue. So there it is, guys, the most common issues with the Gen 3 platform. And if you made it this far in the video, I want to invite you to do a little game with me. I've actually made a bingo sheet of all of the issues that I talked about with this car, and I want to know how many do you have? Did you get a bingo? We can just play a fun game with it. Like I said, I've owned a lot of these. And over the years, I find that they are mostly reliable. I still really enjoy them. I think it's worth putting up with the quirks, but these are the most common issues I found in this platform. Like I said, almost every Montero that I've had has these issues, and I bet that yours has some of them too. So thanks for joining me in this. Leave your comments down below. Let me know what I missed or what you've experienced, and I'll catch you on the next one.